Hi there, I'm Laurel Griffith. Welcome to Sunday School. We are continuing our study of the children of Israel and how God has been working out His covenant promises, how He called Abram and how He is, he is building uh, Abraham's family into a nation so that that nation may be a light for the world. And we have seen how He raised up Moses and used Moses to bring the people out of uh, slavery in Egypt. And then how last week we talked about how uh, Moses gave instructions to the people to be faithful and to continue to worship and obey God and to, uh, as a reminder, to stay away from idols. So under the leadership of Joshua, we know that the children of Israel go into the promised land. The leadership changes. Moses dies in the wilderness and Joshua takes the people forward. While Joshua was alive in that generation, the people seemed to be in connection with God. They worshiped the one true God. But when Joshua died and that generation died with him, then the next generation did not fare so well. They turned their attention away from the worship of the one true God and began to get distracted by the culture around them. And they worshiped at the altar of Baal. They were interested in what these gods uh, that were a part of the culture could do for them. And so we see in the book of Judges that this sets up a cycle for the Israelites. Now they are a tribal people and they are dis decentralized with the loss of Joshua. There is no central figure in their leadership. And so they settle in their uh, various locations, the land that has been given to them and to the tribes that has been allocated to them by God. While they are there, they begin to look around at the Canaanites and get distracted by the idols around them. And so what happens is that when, when they begin to worship at the altar of Baal, then God allows the Canaanites armies, these uh, Midianites we're going to see today, these other people to come in and to conquer the Israelites. They abuse them, they take the land back, they take the resources, they move the Israelites off their property. And so the Israelites suffer under the domination of these other warring tribes that come in. When this happens to the Israelites, they begin to struggle and they find themselves in just these terrible situations. And at that moment, they cry out to God. And when they cry out to God, God is faithful to hear them and to respond. And so Judges tells us these stories of how God raises up judges. And these judges are really military leaders, more military than legal advisors. And he raises up these judges and these judges gather the people and lead the people to defeat the enemy. And then the people have turned their attention back to the worship of God and things go well for a while. And when the things go well for a while, it can be a period of, of a few years up to several decades in some instances, but then eventually out of their times of prosperity, it seems, uh, the people turn their attention away from the worship of God to the worship of Baals. They allow the culture then to begin to influence them and they begin to sink deeper and deeper into the worship of these false gods. And as that occurs, the same cycle continues. And so this happens over and over and over again in Judges. And God is always faithful to respond to their cries. So this brings up a point that I would uh, like to emphasize as we begin this lesson. When we read a scripture passage about a particular figure in scripture, so today is, is Gideon, we have studied Moses, we have studied, um, most recently we studied Abraham not too long ago. When, when we study these individuals, it is important for us to recognize that these figures, these characters, these, these people in history are not the heroes of the story. They are people who we can look to and we can learn from them, but the story is not written to talk about their virtues because they struggle, they have limitations, and sometimes even the, the best of the best, the good guys, uh, will sin and do something that is so out of character that we're left wondering what in the world just happened. Um, and, and so it's good for us to know that the character is not the hero, but rather the story is about God and who God is. And so in this book of Judges, we see that God remains faithful even though his people sin. So the stories that we see are about these various judges that come to, to 
help uh, rescue the people. But the story is really about how God is there behind the scenes, raising up the judge, empowering them, directing them, using them to bring about his good purposes. Judges reveals to us that God is faithful to his people when they cry out to him and God never abandons his covenant. The people are the ones that squander uh, the prosperity and they squander their blessings, but God holds the covenant. God keeps his covenant promises and that is revealed all the way through the Old Testament and it's here clearly in the book of Judges. So now let's talk about Gideon. We are in this cycle again. And so in chapter six, we see what happens as the, as the people cry out to God. The Israelites did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord gave them into the hand of Midian seven years. The hand of Midian prevailed over Israel, and because of Midian, the Israelites provided for themselves hiding places in the mountains, caves, and strongholds. For whenever the Israelites put in seed, the Midianites and the Amalekites and the people of the east would come up against them. They would encamp against them and destroy the produce of the land as far as the neighborhood of Gaza and leave no sustenance in Israel and no sheep or ox or donkey for they and their livestock would come up and they would even bring their tents as thick as locusts. Neither they nor their camels could be counted. So they wasted the land as they came in. Thus Israel was greatly impoverished because of Midian and the Israelites cried out to the Lord for help. So here we see what's going on. Uh, The Midianites and the Amalekites and people from the east are coming and taking advantage of Israel in this moment. And it's so bad that Israel has gone to the caves to live uh, and is calling out to God. Um, These people are coming in and taking the crops. They are bringing their own livestock in and taking over the land. So now let's look at verse 7. When the Israelites cried to the Lord on account of the Midianites, the Lord sent a prophet to the Israelites, and he said to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I led you up from Egypt and brought you out of the house of slavery, and I delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of all who oppressed you and drove them out before you and gave you their land. And I said to you, I am the Lord your God. You shall not pay reverence to the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live but you have not given heed to my voice. Here we have a a wonderful reflection on the idea of remembrance. God sends a prophet, an unnamed prophet, we don't know who this is, to speak to the Israelites and and when they have cried out for uh, God's help. And God reminds them and, and tells them to think back on all that God has done for them. That in these past generations that God has delivered them from slavery, He has protected them in the wilderness, He has brought them into the promised land, He has defeated the Canaanites, He has given them the land, and all He asks is that they will worship Him and be faithful in their loyalty loyalty to him and yet they have rebelled against them and they are not paying attention to anything that God has said to them. They have abandoned the worship of the one true God. And the prophet is calling upon the people to remember, to go back and to remember all that God has done for them. And I think this is uh, there's something here that we can take and incorporate into our own practices, our own lives, and that is this practice of looking back to rehearse and remember. Those are, that's a phrase that is used throughout the Old Testament where the Israelites are called upon to rehearse and remember. And the idea of rehearse is not just to remember intellectually, but to talk about this with one another, to talk about how we have seen God at work. Where have we seen God move in our lives? What has God done that, uh, that shows us his goodness and his love for us and his faithfulness for us? And this practice of remembering gives us the ability to uh, move forward with confidence in the present and also to look to the future. Now we do this in a corporate way as a body as we come together once a month in our church um, to, to observe Holy Communion. And in these moments of communion, we are looking back to see who Jesus is and all that Jesus has done for us with his death on the cross. We experience his presence in a mighty way and it's a moment of where we are We are caught up with Christ as we also think about what he has done for us. So that is a corporate memory. We remember together corporately sometimes when we think about where our church has been and all that our church has done corporately as we think back on the beautiful things that have happened within our congregation. But we also have times 
uh, that are important for us to have to have individual or private remembering where we look back and see God's faithfulness uh, in our lives. Um, I was privileged to grow up in a, in a Christian family and my daddy loved to tell stories and my favorite stories that he told were of his experience with his grandmother and his grandmother was a godly woman who taught him about Jesus. He spent a lot of time with her and she taught him to pray. Uh, they successfully prayed up a baby brother for daddy when, it, when things didn't look good uh, and then she taught him to uh, ask God for wisdom. And so from the time daddy was a little kid, he prayed for wisdom. And daddy taught me those same things that God would hear our prayers. And I love to hear those stories of, of the life that grandmother and he shared together and how she encouraged his faith. And it's my prayer that I have stories of faith where I have seen God at work in my life that I first of all remember those for myself because they give me courage, they give me hope as I look to the future, but also that I am willing to share those stories with my friends, with people I know, but especially to pass them along to my children and my grandchildren, to that next generation, so that this, this beautiful uh, faith that I have experienced and seen grow in my life will be something that my children will also embrace. And so this rehearsing and remembering, I think, is, is not something only that the Israelites needed to do, uh, but also something that we, as, as knowing Jesus, can also do, maybe even in a, in a more beautiful way, because we know the extent of what Christ has done for us. So the prophet has come and called the nation to reflect and remember, and, um, and now we see God meet Gideon uh, and, and call him into service. So let's see Gideon's response. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the oak at Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abizarite, as his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, the Lord is with you, you mighty warrior. Gideon answered him, But sir, if the Lord is with us, then why then is all this happening to us? And where are all his wonderful deeds that our ancestors recounted to us, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has cast us off and given us into the hand of Midian. Here we see that the angel of the Lord has come to speak to Gideon and has called him, and he calls him a mighty warrior. And we know, of course, that this is not really actual uh, reality for Gideon in this moment. Perhaps it is uh, something that, that a vision for who Gideon will become when he responds to all that God wants to do with him. But in this moment, Gideon is hiding uh, from the enemies and he's actually trying to harvest a crop uh, in the wine press, which is, is under cover. And it's not the appropriate place, but he's doing it because he's terrified of the Midianites. And so in this moment of this call, this interaction with God that is must have been just... Um, a bit terrifying, but also overwhelming. Gideon uh, seems to, to be able to speak honestly with God, and he expresses these doubts that he has. And of course, we look at this and say, well, Gideon, the Israelites are suffering because, because they deserve it. They are suffering because of all that they have done that is wrong. But this is still the way Gideon feels. It's his perception of the events around him, and he expresses this to God honestly. And I think there's something there that we can gain uh, in understanding, and that is God hears us when we cry out to Him. And of course, we have to be respectful in our prayers, but He invites us to ask Him questions and to be honest with Him. And so Gideon responds with this doubt of where is God uh, in this moment. So let's see how God responds to him in his answer. Then the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours and deliver Israel from the hand of Midian. I hereby commission you. He responded, But sir, how can I deliver Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. But the Lord said to him, But I will be with you, and you shall strike down the Midianites, every one of them. So here uh, Gideon expresses now his own personal uh, doubt about himself. Um, he says, how can this happen? I am not able to do this. Not only am I inadequate, my human limitations, I'm not qualified, but I am in the, in the family that is the smallest. I am in the least powerful position that there could possibly be in Israel. So essentially, Gideon is telling God, choose somebody else. 
go somewhere else go somewhere else where someone is stronger more powerful that comes from a more connected family that has more resources at their disposal and yet God continues to say no I'm choosing you and you are the one I'm going to use to take care of the Midianites and God is inviting Gideon now to become a part of all that he is doing in the world now this invitation that God gives Gideon I think is something that we can see in our own lives as well for when we think about ourselves as, as we see ourselves probably a lot like Gideon saw himself typically we see our limitations we are aware of our fears we are aware of the places where we feel like we don't measure up we see uh, we see others who appear to be able to do things um, more successfully or, or or they look like they've got the connections or the resources or the time uh, to be able to respond to God's call but yet God says I want to use you God invites each of us every one of his children to bring him ourselves as living sacrifices are and he takes our our lives and he then begins to use them to bring about his great purposes and he delights in using unexpected people I have discovered this in my own life and I think for all of us it's just something beautiful that God delights in taking people that that the world would say these are not the people that God would choose to use but yet he delights in using you and he delights in using me to accomplish his purposes and when we are willing to uh, to trust God to recognize that in our own human limitations that we will not defeat one Midianite but when we offer ourselves to God, that He is the one who will be with us, He is the one who will work through us. And in that moment, we will begin to find the purpose and the meaning that we desire in our lives. So to me, something that's interesting here is to look at God's response to Gideon's uh, doubts. God doesn't try to answer all of Gideon's questions. He doesn't really even give him a response to why all these things are happening. Rather, he just invites him to come and to join him in his work. So you may be sitting here today and, and you may have doubts about why things are the way they are in the world around us, in your own personal life. I think all of us struggle at times, but God's invitation is to join him. And, and as we join him, God reveals himself to us. The questions may not ever be answered as we would prefer, but we will always find out more about who God is, more about His character, His love for us, and His faithfulness to His covenant promises. And we will find the meaning that we desire as we attach our story to His great story of grace and redemption. So it is my prayer for you this week, as you listen to the Lord, that you will respond to His call on your life. I look forward to seeing you again soon. Have a great week.